And I said, besides, Gunny, you only have one eye. Well, he slaps himself in the face on that eye. He said, I only got one bad eye, and he slaps the bad eye. And I said, oh. And he said, well, sir, all I need is one eye to shoot a rifle. Now, I'm close to 70 years old, um, but if I had to do over again, I'd join in a heartbeat. Hi, Ask an Artist here, and I'm excited to say that I am now starting interviews. I'm starting interviews with military members, regardless of branch, regardless of their pay grade, regardless of what their job was, and whether they're active duty or they're retired. One of the things about being in the military is you always bump into other military people, whether they're in the same branch as you or their other branches or they're active duty retired, and someone always has a good story or some sort of knowledge to share, and there's this instant brother-sisterhood when it comes to the fact that you know you've both served together. But in addition to that is this channel alone has been really great in the fact that I've met some people that have served during some crazy times or have some crazy stories. So I've been lucky enough to even have conversed with some of those people. So I'm starting off with the first of one of these interviews with Jim Gibson. He's a retired United States Marine Corps captain, and he served during the time of Operation Desert Storm. However, when he was activated, he didn't go out to Operation Desert Storm. He stated himself he was lucky enough to be able to not get sent out. But he did get activated, and he was ended up working on Camp Pendleton for a long time. But this is his story. I didn't really have an intro before, and I'm just recording this now. And it was really great to be able to sit down and talk with him. And I got to talk to him before, so some of his stories to him he might be repeating a little bit. But it was more so I just wanted to get his voice out there, and he was happy to share his story. And if you two are interested in sharing your story, I'm interested in listening at the very least. Or if you want to share it here, I would love to be able to sit down and interview. So whether you are active duty or your reserve or you are retired and regardless of your branch i would love to sit down talk to you have an interview and share it with other people just to share your story so sit back relax and i hope you enjoy this interview well as you know uh chief <laughs> uh that i was uh, in the marine corps for 13 years as an officer an 03 captain in the marine corps and uh, you know what's kind of interesting is how i ended up in the marine corps and um, it's kind of a backwards type of way that I end up in the Marine Corps. And I, I hope I don't offend my uh, friends who are captains uh, in the Army and the other services. But when I was in college, it seemed like uh, about once every year I'd get some sort of letter from the Marine Corps inviting me to try out for the officer program, things like that. And I'd get T-shirts, really cool-looking T-shirts and things and like that. when was this? This was back, well, I was in college, was uh, 72 to 76. 1972, that is, to 76. And um, got out of college, worked a couple jobs, um, but it was time to get serious about a serious profession. And uh, so, you know, plus I had college loan uh, payments I had to make, which were about equal to a car payment. And so I needed a, a serious job. So, uh, as you know, this might be of interest to you and to your listeners, is my uh, dad uh, was an Army guy, and he was in Second World War. And, of course, his dad was a Marine, and, and I've been able to trace it back, you know, over 100 years that, uh, that someone in uh, my uh, background has been in one of the militaries, usually the Marine Corps or the Army. So I decided what I would do is I'd go down to the um, the Army uh, recruit uh, thing, and uh, I walked inside and I said, you know, I'm very interested in the Army. I'm wondering what uh, you can offer in your programs. And uh, they said, oh, well, you know, you can do this or that, and none of them sounded very interesting to me. So they turned around and they said, they got a little frustrated, I'm sure. And they turned around and they said to me, well, we got what you need to do. And I said, well, fantastic. And remember, this is back in the 70s. So we didn't have v VCRs and, and stuff like that. Uh, what they had is they had a reel-to-reel -reel, um, tape, you know, a, a video, reel-to-reel, uh, -reel, you know, on, on videotape. Or not videotape, but it was, you know, picture tape like, like they used to do the old movies on. And uh, he took me uh, to a room where it was, you know, it was all darkened, and he turned it on. And I just remember, I just got out of college. And so the first thing was the screen was dark. I still remember all the details here. Screen was dark, and he says to me, he says, watch this, you'll really like it. And it started out, and it said, do you like getting up early in the morning? And I thought, <laughs> you got to be kidding. 
I, I like sleeping in. I'm a college student. What are you talking about? And the next thing was, you, you know, wow, in the Army, you're required to run, I think it was a mile. Well, I was on cross country. I was running 12 miles a day. So uh, I, I kind of laughed at that a little bit. And then he said, do you like jumping out of airplanes? That's what it said. It said, in the morning, you're going to jump out of airplanes. And, and I thought, you know, I'm a college student. I don't jump out of airplanes, okay? So I started laughing. He got mad at me, kicked me out. And so from there, <laughs> I went to the Air Force. And remember, this was right after Vietnam. They were downsizing. So I went to the Air Force, and I went in there, and I said, you know, I want to look at your officer's program. And they said, well, we're not hiring. So I said, well, you know, i go check out the Navy. And uh, Navy sounded pretty cool, you know. But I had this thing in the back of my head that what happens if I'm prone to be seasick? And now I got to be seasick for half of my career in the Navy. So I decided to move on from the Navy. But right next door was the Marine Corps. Now, my brother-in-law told me Marines are crazy. They really are. And uh, he said, they teach you how to knock out a tank with a hand grenade, and that's impossible. And so I was kind of shy and away from the Marine Corps. But I stuck my head through the door, opened it up, stuck my head through the door, and I said, are you interested in a college student that wants to become an officer? And they said, yeah, come on in. And I said, Don't, do you care about what my degree is in? They said, no, just care that you finish college. And so I started the process, and it took me, I would say, a year and a half before um, I finished all the requirements. The running was never a problem, still running, you know, 10 miles a day. Um, I, I didn't know what was going on at the Marine Corps, but they called it a PFT, physio, physical fitness test, PFT. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so I aced the PFT uh, as a 22-year-old, uh, and they were all happy with that. So that's how I ended up joining the Marine Corps. So when you joined, what did your job end up being, your MOS? Well, my MOS was 2502, uh, communications officer. And uh, I can walk you through the whole thing of how, I, you know, the schools that went through and all. So I started out with... Uh, uh, OCS, Officer Candidate School there in Quantico, uh, Virginia, and uh, it, I don't know how long it was, uh, maybe somewhere between 10 and 12 weeks at the time, and uh, I just really enjoyed it. It was just a great time. I know others struggled through it. I just thought it was fantastic. And then from there, I went to the basic school for the rest of the year. I started in January 1979, and uh, and I think I graduated... Um, I think it was April 1st, um, the same year, 79, 1979. And then from uh, there, I went to the basic school right there on base at Quantico. And that they teach officers uh, how to land, navigate, tactics, small unit tactics, things like that, leadership, uh, history and traditions of the Marine Corps and the Naval Services. And, um, and then from there, I went to officer uh, communication school right there at the same base, Quantico. And that was about four months long. And then once I got out, uh, I was assigned to 2501, which meant like a junior officer in communications. Uh, I think you had to wait a year before they made you a 2502. And so I went, my first job was managing a, um, uh, a uh, data center. It was a uh, uh, classified, we were classified all the way up to top secret. And I had about 12 uh, junior Marines, and we managed the communications, uh, written communications. It was before e email and stuff like that. Uh, so these were all communications that were going to the uh, units there on Camp Pendleton. So what places were you all stationed then? I was always, most of the time, 90% of the time, I was at Pendleton, California. So it just seemed like when they were getting ready to transfer me to Okinawa or something like that, they would turn around and say, no, you've been reassigned to Pendleton. So after, after doing the, uh, the data center, uh, uh, that's what they call it. I don't know if they even have it anymore because technology has changed so much. But it was a mainframe, and you know we had to change codes and stuff like that every so often. And uh, we, I know in my... There was four officers, four junior officers, first and second lieutenants, and uh, we broke it up into four what they call watches, and uh, we handled it. was 24-7, and I know I handled, uh, on average, about 40,000 messages. 
Didn't you tell me one time you were uh, stationed in Texas? Uh, yes, I was stationed in Texas for a short couple years. I, I can't even tell you the name of the unit, but it was a reserve unit, and it was Arlington, Texas, and they were really good people. I really enjoyed working with them. Um, and uh, my job was I, I, I was launch and recovery officer. Now, I knew nothing about launch and recovery. You know, and they said, "Oh, don't worry about it. That's just you're filling a billet. You got other things to do. And since you got a communications background, you can support our communications people." So it was kind of interesting. Uh, actually, before that, I was with an artillery unit out of Philadelphia, um, and uh, I know nothing about artillery. So I was an un um, what do you call it? I was a, so I was an unrestricted uh, commu- uh, officer uh, in the Marine Corps, so I could. Do, I just did whatever the uh, Marine Corps told me to go do. Yeah, in the Navy, we have something similar. They either call them uh, staff officers, which, as you can see, were lawyers or there would be dentists, um, medical personnel, uh, something like that. And then you have line officers, and those would be what you would call unrestricted, which means they can go and they'll be in charge of many different things. And those are the ones that end up being like commanding officers of ships and commands. Uh, but how I remember you talking to me about the – the end of your career got a little more, I would say, de- defined as far as the rest of it was concerned. What do you have to deal with over 3,000 men? Uh, well, no. Um, that was near the end of, of my career. So I was a reservist at that point, and I kept on um, staying with the reserves for a while. But as, as you know, with the reserves, you, it, you sign a contract extending your reserve for commitment every three years. And I was starting a business that was really taking off an IT business. And, you know, I got to I got to credit uh, the Marine Corps for that, uh, that they were the ones that taught me IT. Now, they didn't teach me civilian IT. OK, but they taught me the principles. They taught me the principles of leadership management, um, how to, uh, you know, take a group of people and put them together as a team, things like that. But they also taught me the technical side of communications and management. And also, I, I handled uh, not back then. They didn't call it cybersecurity, but it was security for the uh, for the um, for the data center, things like that. For the uh, the communications, uh, computer and communications security. So, so after that, I was out for a while. Uh, what happened was I had one day left on my uh, reserve commitment back in the uh, early 90s, uh, 1990, and I got uh, activated for Desert Storm. You know what was really interesting was I was an RRR, Individual Ready Reserve, which meant I just showed up once a year to show that I still had all my limbs, that I still had my eyeballs, and I was still healthy enough to be activated. So, you know, I'd show up and report to the doctor and everything else. They'd ask me a couple questions and things like that, make sure they had the right address. And then I'd go away. And I had one day left on my reserve commitment, and I got activated for Desert Storm. Now, just to pull back a day or two before that, um, I was activated on a Monday. Uh, over that weekend, uh, they were talking about activating more reservists. And I said to my wife, I said, dear, don't worry. They're not going to activate me. I am an IRR. They haven't activated the IRR since uh, Vietnam. And I said, so they're not going to activate it for Desert Storm. they got plenty of people. They don't need me. And, uh, of course, uh, I went to work Monday. I was due to get on an airplane and fly to Toledo, Ohio, in support of uh, communications efforts there. And I uh, couldn't get on the plane because I was noticed that I was to return home immediately. I've been activated for the Marine Corps. And as soon as I got home, of course, I had to pack up and go. I had to get a haircut first, too, at the local haircut place. But once I got there, I remember I went through the line and I signed up. I signed all the, you know, the things like that you normally do when you get activated. Uh, you know, you, you had to do a will. They had to check to see if you're medically fit, things like that. Uh, you have to get all your shots up to date, things like that. So I went all through all this uh, rigmarole for about, a, I would say, two or three days uh, to get brought back into active duty. And when I was uh, back into active duty, um, I, I waited. I got at the end of the line, and I, I said to the, uh, uh, the person manning the line, I said, um, where am I going? Uh, where are you assigning me to? And, and uh, 
I remember it was a female Marine, and she said, we don't know, we don't have your orders yet. So I sat at the end, and I sat at the end. Now, the people in front of me, they went to Kuwait or to Saudi Arabia. I don't know where. I think it was Saudi Arabia. And then uh, those who were behind me went to Saudi Arabia. So here I am. I don't have orders. And then all of a sudden, after three days of sitting there and drinking coffee and eating donuts, uh, someone from uh, the unit came up to me. I think it was a, a colonel. And he said, we've been looking all over the place for you. We pulled you out of the line because you're supposed to set up a, a unit from scratch. And I said, well, fantastic. I'm thinking communications. Why in the world would they pull me aside uh, to do something other than communications? Uh, and, but they said, no, you're going to start a unit that's going to house those individuals who are waiting court-martial or those individuals who have been injured um, in active duty. Now... The way I look at it, that we used to call that the lame, sick, and lazies uh, people. I had a really uh, about a third of the the people were uh, solid, uh, good Marines uh, that were assigned to me because they were getting ready to process them out, and they just didn't couldn't do it right away. So I had total uh, three thousand five hundred uh, Marines assigned to me, even though I was a captain. Um, so I had what I would call my staff was about 100 or 200 uh, Marines. Most of them were reservists on active duty, and most of them were senior uh, enlisted. So, man, they, I had master gunnery sergeants working for me and all, and it was just a great time. I just, you know, we just took care of all the problems, everything else. There was a lot of lawyers involved because we had to put people, um, some people had to go right into the brig. Others, the brig was full, so I had to maintain them and make sure they didn't do any further damage. And it turned out to be a pretty good time. And I spent almost a year doing that. And then I was released from active duty in 1991 in the fall. So they activated you for Desert Storm, but they never sent you over and said you worked with this group here? Uh, no, you mean o over there in in the field in in uh, the the area? You, you mean the Middle East? Well, yeah. So the, when they're activating individual raid reserves or everyone and sending them over to Desert Storm, they never sent you over. They just kept you local. They kept me local, and um, I, I I don't know why I was picked. Uh, someone said that someone in the headquarters of Marine Corps picked me uh, to do this special assignment. So I had to research it, how to start a unit how to start this type of unit. And so I had to organize the staff uh, because we had people coming in each day. And I tell you, it was so crazy. Um, uh, the things that were going on that, you know, it just, it, it, it just, you know, we were, people were coming in a hundred at a time uh, each day and we had to process them in. We had to make sure they had place to sleep. We had to separate some people. I had uh, pregnant uh, women. I had women that just gave birth. Um, and, uh, they, they, you know, took their, uh, 10 day old or whatever it was, uh, child and given it to a relative. And in one case, a lady gave her, uh, baby to a neighbor. She had no one else to take care of it. She was a single mom, gave her baby, uh, to, uh, the neighbor. So what I did is I took all the moms, all the ones that just had a baby in the last couple of months, things like that. I had a secure uh, building, and I stuck all of them in that secure building, and I got them telephones. And uh, I gave the telephones to them, and I took the senior person, the senior uh, person from that group, and I said, you just assign uh, a list of when they, you know, who's going to call home, things like that. And um, so they rotated, and they spent their whole day, and I always noticed, you know, a lot of times they were just crying and all. I mean, was, why do you activate people like this? I mean, these were good people, and I know they had reserve commitment, but there's exceptions to this. So I, I pulled all their files, and I put them in the front of processing and made sure that they were processed as fast as possible to get them back home. But we had some other interesting things. I had an old gunnery sergeant. I don't know how he ended up um, back there, but I know he's there with me. He's a good guy. Uh, but, gosh, he must have been in his 80s. He looked like, he looked like Popeye. To be honest with you, he really did. And he was blind in one eye. And I talked to him and I said, uh, Gunny, why are you here? You know, it's like, it was like a Korean War veteran. 
And he said, um, you know, I'm just happy to serve my country. And I said, well, Gunny, you served enough of your country, okay? You need to go home and enjoy life uh, and, and spend time with your family. And he looked at me and he said, sir, I don't have a family. My wife's dead. We didn't have kids. I don't have anybody. This is it for me. I really, really want to stay in. Can you do anything to keep me? And I said, you know, Gunny, I don't think so. And I said, besides, Gunny, you only have one eye. Well, he slaps himself in the face on that eye. He said, I only got one bad eye. And he slaps the bad eye. And I said, oh. And he said, well, sir, all I need is one eye to shoot a rifle. <laughs> so I said, Gunny, it's not going to happen, man. You're going to go... Um, you're going to go back home and enjoy life. And so um, I left the area for a while. Now, remember, this is chaos time, okay? I had a big area. I had a lot of people, you know, all over the place that I had to make sure I confined to certain areas and things like that and protect others and, and make sure everyone's being processed. And so I went away for a while. When I came back a couple hours later, there was an ambulance uh, out front of the building and... Uh, I said, well, what happened? I went to my um, master gunnery sergeant who was, uh, uh, you know, my acting XO. I was the only officer, and I preferred it that way. But I was the only officer in the XO. Uh, the guy who was acting, you know, is my operations person, actually. He said, you know, sir, remember that old gunny? And I said, yeah. He said, he died. I said, he got what he wanted. He died on active duty. So he may have been the oldest Marine to die activated for Desert Storm in the Marine Corps. Do you remember, Do you remember his name at all? <laughs> no, I don't, but he was a character. He looked like, you know, like I said, he looked like Popeye. He was all skin and bones, and you could tell he was really old, really old. And he just, he had a good heart. Uh, he's motivated. And when I, and when I said to him, I said, you know, Gunny, you know, when he explained to me he didn't have any family, I said, no, I still can't keep you, Gunny. You got to go home. And, uh, he said, all I want to do is die for my country. And I said, Gunny, isn't the idea is to get the other guy to die for their country? You're to live for your country. And I said, you served our country for many decades. I said, just, you need to go home. I can't keep you. They won't allow me to process you out. That's why I have you. They sent you to me to process you out. So he, uh, he died. Died on active duty, and I wonder if anyone could fact check that to see what's the oldest person that died on active duty during Desert Storm. So you talked about before how you were working with IT and you started your company afterwards. Uh, did that being working in IT in the data centers uh, and being a uh, communications officer did that help you at all with starting your company afterwards? Well, Marine Corps overall uh, helped me with starting a company because you learn management, you learn leadership. Uh, and you know, uh, and I knew the I knew in depth um, uh, IIT. They didn't call it IT back then, but I knew that in depth. Um, so when I got out, I worked for a couple of corporations as a reservist. I was a reservist at the time, but you know, I worked for a couple of corporations in the IT department and uh, learned a lot of what you do in the civilian world compared to military. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was great, helpful. And then I spent. Uh, now 40 years in IT, I owned a company that was successful, that was uh, went national. Uh, we had uh, installations uh, all over the United States. We designed networks for big corporations and things like that and worked many years doing it. Now I'm semi-retired, even though I hate that word, retired. So I still got things to do. So looking back on it, what are some things that you're grateful? Uh, for example, you're saying that it taught you a lot of things. Marine Corps taught you a lot of things about business and IT. Uh, are there any other things that you're grateful that you learned while you're in the Marine Corps or, or anything that you still use now? Uh, yeah, I think the Marine Corps is always going to be with me. Um, I just learned so much that you don't learn in civilian life. And I know it's the same in the Navy, uh, by the way, Chief. So I'm not trying to, to think that, you know, it's not that you don't learn, you know. But at the same time, there's a lot that I learned in, uh, in the Marine Corps that still sticks with me today. Um, I, I could not have, I don't think I would have been able to start a business without that Marine Corps background. Um, because, you know, as a Marine, you just view life differently. Um, 
you know, you, you sometimes you, you see silly things out in the civilian world, and and I'm well adjusted. You know, I'm I ran a civilian business for forty years, a very successful one, but sometimes you see things out in, um, you know, out in the civilian world, um, and people acting a certain way uh, that just wouldn't be tolerated in the Marine Corps. So when I would have people like that. You know, I always tried to make sure I, I trained people, things like that. Now, you know, when you first asked me about how I ended up in Marine Corps, I didn't want to just badmouth the Army. Army's fine. In fact, one of the things I, you know, during my career in the Marine Corps, they, um, you know, I'm in the middle of doing, you know, organizing my unit. I'm in the middle of training. I'm teaching people things. I'm making sure that they, they're able to do their mission, things like that. And all of a sudden I'm told that I've been assigned a special assignment. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, you're going to go to uh, uh, Barstow. And at Barstow, you're going to meet an Army general there, and, and he has work for you to do. And I said, absolutely. I'll, I'll be happy to go. And they said, good. Go home, pack, and <laughs> immediately go home, pack, and dress in civilian clothes. I said, civilian clothes? Why would I be in civilian clothes? They said, because you're going to take a Greyhound. I said, you're kidding. I'm going to take a Greyhound to Barstow in civilian clothes and then figure out how to get from, you know, whatever gate or wherever I'm able to drop me off. Uh, and I'm going to go, you know, there to the base and everything else. And they said, yeah, you're on your own. Here's your orders. Keep track of your, uh, your costs. So I showed up and um, I showed up to uh, the general there. Uh, I don't remember if he was a one or two star general. And he looked at me and he said, I told the Marine Corps I wanted a lieutenant colonel and they sent me a lieutenant. And I said, well, sir, I just do what, what the orders tell me to do. And he said, well, I'm looking for someone that knew, knows communications. And so I said, absolutely, I'm, uh, I know communications. Uh, would you like me to go back home or do you want to use me? And he said, well, I'll use you. That would be fine. So I had a great time. I was assigned. He was... This general, uh, Army general, man, he was fantastic. I loved working for him, and and he was very professional, and that's what I liked uh, about working for him because he was that way. But he, I got a special little badge or something that identified me as working for the J-6 staff. And the J-6 staff back then, I don't know what it is today, but that was evaluation. And it was right after uh, there was a major accident um, I know there's a little side note here, but this is why I was involved. There was an accident of a plane that took off uh, from the airport there in Washington, D.C. during the winter storm and crashed into a bridge and sunk. Well, on that plane was a majority of communications officers for the Rapid Deployment Force, and they were dead. Sorry to say that. I felt sorry for the families, and it was a nasty accident. You can still see it on YouTube by the way, uh, pulling people out of a frozen river, the Potomac River there. Um, so my job was uh, to evaluate the newly formed uh, communications assets. And so I said, absolutely. And here I am, a first lieutenant. There were some other people uh, there were assigned, but they were not si assigned to communications. They were assigned to uh, the other aspects of the Rapid Deployment Force. Uh, but I was a junior officer. I mean, there was there was a lot of uh, uh, other people there, captains and majors and lieutenant colonels, and there was a lot of Navy people. In fact, one was, I don't know, commander, uh, maybe even higher. I don't recall. It's been so long. Uh, but he used to jab at me all the time. You know, the Marine Corps was this and that. And I, and I, I think I already told you this joke, right? that one night we used to gather on Friday nights. I'd travel, okay? I would travel the whole time looking for, uh, uh, see how uh, the rapid deployment force at that time during an exercise, how they were performing and where the weaknesses were. But we'd all get together on Friday night back at Barstow. And, um, and one time uh, I was being harassed by the senior officers there, friendly harassment, jabbing. And uh, the one guy said to me, he said, um, uh, one of the Army guys turned around and said, isn't the Marine Corps part of the Navy? And I said, no, sir, they are not part of the Navy. They are part of the Department of the Navy. And uh, 
I, the the senior uh, naval guy said to me, well, no, no, they're really part of the Navy. And I said, sir, that's, that's simply not true. And he says, well, can you prove it? I said, absolutely. I said, sir, you know, on your ships, you always have a Marine detachment, right? And he said, yeah, most of them. And I said, you know what those Marines are there for? And he said, yeah, shine my shoes. And I said, no, sir, they're there to make sure you don't screw up our equipment. So... <laughs> Got a big laugh out of that. I had a great time. I found some um, major problems that had to be addressed and did a report on them. And, and after a short period of time, I was sent back to the Marine Corps. So I know one of the jobs was my, that general. And gosh, I wish I knew his name. He's such a great guy, that Army general. Um, he assigned me to go back to Camp Pendleton. And he says, I want you to go back to Pendleton. And I want you to find the 1st Marine Division um, I don't know. I don't know what unit. I, he was a full bird, but I don't know what his position was. I don't remember. And he says, and you're to go in and ask him these three questions. And I went into his office, appropriately knocked on the door. He had guards, actually. Uh, and uh, I had to show my little badge from the, uh, the J staff. And he had, uh, he let me in the front door there. And I went in to see the, the, the colonel. Now, remember, I'm a first lieutenant, man. This is a colonel. So I went in there. And, you know, said, sir, my, uh, my boss, the general such and such, has asked, uh, wants you to answer three questions. Is if, you know, I need to ask you these questions. And he started screaming and yelling at me, man. I couldn't believe it. And then he said, get out of my office. And I said, yes, sir, and went out. And so I called my, uh, my general, and, uh, and uh, he turned around, and he said, lieutenant, get back in there and ask the questions. So I knocked on the door again, and uh, he and... I went back in, and the guy got took a fit even before I could ask the questions. And he kicked me out the second time. So I went out the second time, <laughs> and I called my general, and he said, now you're to go there, and you're not to leave his office until he answers those three questions. And so I went in there, and the colonel invited me to exit. And I said, sir, I am not allowed to exit until my general has given me specific orders that I am not allowed to exit until you answer these three questions. And, um, you know, he answered the three questions. Then he said, you know, I understand you're stationed here at Pendleton. And I said, yes, sir, I am. He goes, I'll keep that in mind. But I got the three answers. Nothing ever happened. It was a fun time, though. He just didn't really like answering to the uh, the general there, huh? No, he did not want to answer to this general. And, you know, they could have got on the phone and talked themselves. I don't know why he sent a junior officer. What was strange was, remember, they were waiting. They wanted a lieutenant colonel, right, for this job. So I ended up with a helicopter, you know. So they flew me from Barstow in a helicopter back to Pendleton uh, to ask these three questions. And then I got flown back to Barstow. Not it's not bad having a personal escort. It's first time. Army helicopter. <laughs> uh, so, last question before I have some few questions uh, about some of the stories you told me before is if you were to go back and do it again, would you do it again? Or, or And if yes, would you do it any differently? Uh, yes, I'd do it again. And I think I'd put more effort into it. Um, and I think that I would take advantage of uh, more opportunities that I was given. Uh, again, I had, I'm absolutely happy with the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps doesn't owe me anything. I owe them a lot for what they taught me, uh, for the things I've been able to use that they taught me since then. You know, I don't think I would have been successful in business without that knowledge that I learned in the Marine Corps. Um, I never considered it early on as a career. I just considered it as something that I was going to do until I found something better to do. And I think I would have changed that attitude. I think I mentioned to you, uh, Chief, that um, that there's a couple there's a couple groups of people. There are some that are highly motivated; they love the service that they're in, and there's others that constantly complain about it, and they can't wait till they get out. And one of the things I recommended to you is always stay away from those people, um, and stay as far as you can away from the the negative people that are constantly complaining and they constantly hate. So if I had to do over again, I, I think from day one I would have considered it as a career and I would have worked towards uh, making it a career rather than, you know, doing – I did more than my minimum time, uh, but at one point I just got out so I could get a, uh, you know, what I thought was going to be a better job. But after I got out, I realized I really liked the Marine Corps. It was fun. 
and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed having the, the responsibilities and things like that. And so, you know, when they were doing downsizing after uh, uh, Desert Storm, I got caught up in the downsizing. So, so bonus story I want to ask you about. You've told me a couple of stories that while you were in charge of the uh, the sick and lames, as you said. <laughs> Lame, sick, and lazies. <laughs> Lame, sick, and lazies. Mm -hmm. You were talking about before how, like, there was just times that they would just act out or mm -hmm. they were they would go out and do things that they weren't supposed to be doing. And there was a couple of times where uh, maybe they destroyed government property and you went kind of detective mode and you uh, and you tr you found out who it was that either defaced the property or even like popped tires on, on Jeeps. Do you, do you oh, you want me to talk about some of those? So that was it. Um, one of them was it. Uh, uh, combat engineers, first combat engineer battalion. Uh, I was doing, I was a duty, uh, first combat engineer battalion on a Friday night to Saturday morning type of thing. Actually, 24 hours, but uh, this story took place between Friday night and Saturday morning. So, uh, you know, they said you had to walk your post, and there was other people walking posts, obviously, that that were to report to me, and I was down at the Motor T area. And so I'd go down there, let's say, at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning, and again, at sunrise. And so I was showed up at sunrise and, and there was a Jeep on the, the side and it just happened to be the Jeep that my unit used. It was a, a Jeep that was very expensive, had a lot of communications equipment on it and it was on its side. And so I looked around, no one was around. I didn't know where the, the uh, area guard was. I know he walked his post and it was a big motor T area because you're gonna have heavy equipment, you're gonna have things like that, bulldozers, backhoes, you know a lot of stuff going on there. So it's a big motor T area. So as he was, uh, I mean, as I was seeing this Jeep, I popped the hood and uh, I felt the engine and the engine was still warm, but not hot. And it was leaking oil and it was on the side of a hill. And so I, uh, I, I measured how far it was moving per um, like a five minute time frame. So I knew that the Jeep was there for about two and a half hours, three hours. And it was all muddy. There was mud inside and everything else. Uh, there was mud on the tires. There was mud all over it. And I could see the trace of mud was coming from the field in the back. So what I did was I started walking uh, to trace the mud um, to where it was. And I walked all the way to the, to the fence there. And when I got to the fence, I could see there was a lot of footprints. There was things like that that I could see where the Jeep got stuck and uh, people probably parked it right up against the fence from what I understand happened, and then they jumped over the fence. Um, now, once they jumped over the fence, they were in town. So they were using it as, uh, you know, moving uh, to go in town. And, um, and then once they got it stuck, they, they pulled it out, and they, they brought it back, and on the way back, they hit the side of the building, which flipped the Jeep on its side. So when I, by the time I got back, the area guard uh, was walking his post and he saw me and, and, and was shocked about me and about the Jeep uh, on its side. Um, so, you know, first thing I looked at was I looked at this, uh, uh, you know, it was Lance Corporal, I think, something like that. He was newly in the Marine Corps. Um, and so I looked at at him and there was no mud on him. He had a, a pretty clean uh, outfit, but he was really tired. You could tell he's looking down at his shoes and kind of just struggling along. And so when he spotted me, kind of did a, a startle uh, and then, uh, you know, addressed me properly and everything else. And he sold the Jeep and I, he said to me, he said, or I said to him, do you know anything about this? And he goes, no, it's the first time I've seen it myself. And so uh, that was it, reported it all to the CO. Uh, next, uh, NIS showed up, uh, Naval Investigation Service. Now, this is what they called it before it became Naval Criminal Investigation Service. And so I saw the, uh, uh, the guy showed up, and he went in my office, and he asked me all the details. I told him all the details, and he said, well, it's obviously it's area guard. I said, no, this, this guy did not do it. I said he's, he, he had a perfectly clean uniform that was normal for being on duty for 10 hours. NIS was about to invest, or came to my office to investigate this incident and took a statement from me and everything else. Now, the reason why, because I really didn't think they were, anyone would show up over just a Jeep, 
uh, but the equipment that was bolted to this Jeep was was special communications equipment and uh, well, ex, you know, was in excess compared to just an average Jeep. Um, you know, maybe a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment attached to it, and. Uh, so they came to the office and they asked questions and everything else. And at the end of the investigation, uh, the uh, and, uh, NIS agent uh, said that uh, uh, that he felt it was area guard. And I said, no, it's impossible. The area guard didn't do it. I, I know his mannerisms and what he acted and everything else. Plus, I also gave him all the facts concerning how long the Jeep was. Their Jeep was filthy dirty with mud all over it and people standing on the hood and stuff like that. I could see the, the mud marks on the hood and the vehicle had mud inside of it and everything else. So I said, no, it, it's not the area guard. The only thing you could possibly charge the area guard with is dereliction of duty, which is not even that. That, that area was so large that uh, it was easy for a, a Jeep, even one on its side, uh, you could walk past it and not know what was going on. Um, so I was concerned about that, but they did charge the young lad uh, uh, for that crime. I don't know what they charged him for, but I knew they were having a meeting about a week or two later with him in there, and maybe a further investigation, or maybe uh, they were taking disciplinary issues. Um, but as I walked back to my car, I looked back in that direction, just casually looked back, and I could see another Jeep uh, heading towards that same area on a Friday night. So I quickly went down to the uh, Motor T officer that was involved in this discussion with NIS um, and said to him uh, about his Jeep that he's missing a Jeep most likely and it's heading towards the fence. And I said, so it's, you know, it's probably the same group of people that did the first Jeep, but, you know, you'll, someone's got to investigate. And so I hope that young man did not end up with any disciplinary issues against him. But I often wondered why uh, NIS came to a conclusion that it was him so fast. I mean, some of the things they said, we had camouflage, obviously, on that Jeep. And that camouflage back then, I don't know if it's the same way today, but that camouflage back then had sand in it. It had a rough surface to it. And he mentioned he was going to uh, uh, print, uh, cool, uh, you know, see if he can get prints off the Jeep. And I said, well, that's, you know, that's fine. But what are you going to prove? That a Marine touched the Jeep? I can guarantee you that a Marine touched the Jeep. Why don't we start asking some better questions than that? So we kind of joked around in our unit after they caught the four guys um, the second time um, that no innocent person... Uh, or all innocent people are in danger as long as the NIS is around. <laughs> now, maybe they reformed it, you know, after the Iowa situation, you know, with uh, the turret blowing up. They they had some wild accusations back then, too. Um, that was, And then after that, they were called NCIS. So I don't know if it's um, equivalent. Now, just to let you know, as a civilian running a civilian company, um, for IT equipment and all. I worked for NCIS <laughs> uh, there in Pendleton and on the West Coast. Uh, put in, you know, my guys were putting in uh, equipment that they requested to be installed certain ways and, and things like that. So maybe they've changed, and I hope they've changed. I hope they're a lot more professional today than they were back then in the, in the 80s. And uh, yeah, back then in the 80s. You know, Chief, um, the Marine Corps and the Navy have a, a special relationship, and even though you joke back and forth with it, you know, or I joke back and forth with it, with uh, Navy uh, questions and, you know, and, and little jokes and stuff like that, they really do have a special relationship. And uh, a lot of people who are not in the Navy or the Marine Corps may not be aware of it, that the Marine Corps depends a lot on the Navy, especially in the area of medical and corpsmen. I mean, corpsmen are really loved by Marines. Uh, they are just fantastic people. They go with you into combat. They're right there all the time. They, they, all the ones I've met have had an excellent attitude and everything else, very professional. But one incident that happened to me just two weeks ago, in fact, um, I was out at Lowe's and I had my little uh, hat on that has a Marine Corps logo on. It's just a regular civilian hat, but had the uh, Marine Corps logo on it. 
And as I was walking out, um, I actually ran into uh, someone, and we, he was asking me some questions about Lowe's. Where do, you know, do I know where this part is or that part is? And I didn't know it. But I noticed he had a Marine Corps cover on. Uh, not a Marine Corps cover, excuse me. He had a Navy uh, uh, cover, you know, one of those ones that, that veterans wear a lot. And um, I said, oh, you were in the Navy? And he said, yeah, I was in the Navy. And... Uh, I said, great, what did you do in the Navy? And he said, I was a corpsman. And I said, corpsman, oh, man. I said, I was in the Marine Corps. And at that point, he saw my emblem on my uh, cover there, and, and he got all excited. He goes, yeah, I was a corpsman. And, and I said, well, so when were you in? And it turned out that this guy was probably about 85 years old, but we were instant friends because he was a Navy corpsman, and I was in the Marine Corps. We were instant friends. And yet this guy was in a walker. He was probably near the end of his life. But we became instant friends and probably talked about 10 or 15 minutes apart. Now, I run into, during my time, I've worked with uh, a lot with the Navy, uh, it being a, a sister uh, organization. Uh, and I could probably make a joke at this point about the Marine Corps owning the Navy rather than the Navy owning the Marine Corps. Because we joke about that often, that the Navy's primary responsibility is taking care of the Marine Corps um, and getting us to where we need to go. Um, but at the same time, I've also worked with Air Force people who have been professional. And not, not everybody in the military is professional. Um, and, of course, I have great respect working. I worked with a uh, little bit, very little bit, with uh, the airborne units in the Army. I worked a little bit with them. And I worked with that Army general, uh, who I thought was absolutely uh, remarkable individual. Uh, I really like that. So all the services. And I have a good friend that was in the uh, Coast Guard, even though I joke with him about, uh, about joining the Coast Guard because he couldn't get into the Navy. So, you know, we kind of joke a lot about that. But the services, all of them, are excellent. Uh, of course, I feel closer to the Navy we have the same uh, language, you know, bulkhead, deck, uh, things like that. So we use the same language. Um, and the Navy is a sister uh, organization to the Marine Corps. But, I mean, you know, it's just like if you're listening to this and you're in the Navy or, or if you're in the Marine Corps or any other service, it's a great thing. Yeah, it has problems. Yeah, it's tedious sometimes. I've been there. I've done that. I felt it. Everything else. But, you know, the benefits of being in the military, the camaraderie, or camaraderie uh, of the people you're working with, things like that, um, this is fantastic. And, it's, and, and I would not, I mean, I would not even give up. I mean, I'd give up. A, it would be in a heartbeat. How's that? That I would have no problems with being in the, full-time in the Navy. And I, I have great respect for you being a chief because that's quite an accomplishment. And... Um, you know, it's just being in the military is special. And I think one of the things I have to complain about, though, is the civilians. I don't think civilians understand uh, military people. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they understand um, the time, the effort uh, that it took to, to be in the military. Now, with the officer program, when I went into OCS, I would say by the time I was – yeah, at graduation that there was at least 40% who started that didn't finish. Um, so it's not, it's just not take anybody type of things. The military has standards and have done fantastic uh, accomplishments in the past. And I hope it's still the same. I hope that it's still uh, growing in its professionalism and, and its, and its uh, technology and things like that. Now, I'm close to 70 years old, um, but if I had to do over again, I'd join in a heartbeat. Uh, 